we might start. I welcome everyone to this Friday's uh, webinar uh, within the framework of the European Distance Learning Week. We have been attending different and very interesting webinars during this week. Uh, we had uh, um, different inputs and clues and I am sure that uh, today it will be very, very interesting to have this touch of uh, uh, international experiences with uh, um, lawyers. Uh, as you can see here, we have uh, um, uh, a very important panel here, apart from myself, of course. Uh, and um, why we uh, decided to include uh, a view on international uh, experiences. Um, first of all, because it's important, I think these kind of, uh, of uh, sessions are very important uh, for networking and for the possibility to know more about each other's work in the field of uh, open uh, resources. Um, exchange regarding um, activities, uh, but also uh, different uh, approaches from a cultural point of view are are very um, interesting and and to be to be valued. Uh, so I don't want to steal uh, more more time <laughs> with my uh, reflections. Um, we'll have uh, uh, first uh, Martin James Weller presenting here, uh, his contribution on evaluating our impact. Um, Martin is from the Open uh, University. Um, he uh, is professor at the Institute of Educational Technology at the Open University, in fact, and he is the director of the OR Hub a Research Unit uh, examining the impact of open education. So I think he's uh, really an expert uh, who can tell us about this sort of impact. The floor to you, Martin. Thank you. I'm showing your you me, okay? presentation you in a moment. Uh, okay. Mm. Here it is. I've got lots of big pictures, so it might take time to load. <coughs> it's a little bit, yeah, yeah, because there are so many pictures, but it, you know, it will come. Okay. <laughs> the the audio is okay. Yeah, perfect for me. Okay, good. I think for everyone. Hmm. So, hi everyone. I'm in Cardiff, in Wales, at the moment. Uh, you may be you may see my dog walking around behind me occasionally because it's this is usually his walk time, so he's pestering me to go for a walk at the moment. So. <laughs> Should come. So, the talk I'm about to give is a slightly reduced version of one I gave. Um, in Rotterdam this week, actually, at the SURF conference. Mm. So uh, it may still, it probably means I'm going to go over lots of subjects and not enough detail, but um, we'll see. Yeah, unfortunately. It was up before. I can see it. Before. Yeah, but also we, yeah, we tried a minute ago and it was working. Maybe mm, uh, Christina is trying to fix it. Just a few moments. Okay, here it is. Okay, here we go. Okay, thank you. <laughs> Sorry. So I'm going to talk about uh, open education more broadly and sort of how OER fits into that um, by trying to sort of think of it as a, a landscape. And I'm going to draw on a couple of bits of research that I've been doing uh, with others to do that. So uh, first, I thought I'd think about why is it important, sort of trying to address that question. Why should why should we care about uh, open education and OER? Um, then look at that kind of landscape. What do we mean? What are the various areas under that? Um, and then what are the impacts and issues? Uh, I'm not going to do this bit about where it's heading. That was in my longer talk, so you won't get that bit. Uh, so just going back to those things about why is it important? Um, and I think that actually it's not a question we ask ourselves very often. We kind of because it's openness, it's good. It's a kind of like it's a kind of default assumption that OER and open education are just good things. Uh, but I think it's worth thinking about what their role is in education. So um, 
there's a kind of growing demand for higher education. So the British Council reckons there's going to be um, another 21 million places, additional places needed in higher education uh, by 2020. And another report has it at 100 million by 2025. So there's a real problem that kind of traditional approaches, traditional infrastructure won't be able to cope with that increasing demand. And also a lot of that growth will be seen in countries like the Philippines, China, uh, Brazil. Um, and many of those students may not be able to attend a face-to-face -face university. They may be working. So that the, the needs of the people coming into higher education uh, is liable to change. And for the first time in uh, in the US, and but also elsewhere, we're seeing that uh, what we used to think of as the traditional student is no longer the majority. So the 18 to 22 year old uh, studying full time on campus, that's now not the majority mode of studies. People are older than that. They're often studying part time, blended learning. Um, and those people have different needs and different demands. Often they've got family, work, uh, different issues. That, and also they're studying for different motivations as well. So um, again, the traditional model might not fit all of the students now. Uh, and increasingly, a, a digital economy requires people to have uh, different types of skills. So uh, I live in Wales. We developed a, a competence framework, a digital competence framework that uh, goes across all primary and secondary education. So regardless of what subjects you're studying, you develop certain digital competencies like um, learning to research online. Um, and whilst openness is not the same as digital. Um, there are elements of openness, I think, that we can learn from here. It's learning how to share, how to be part of a, a community. Um, and also, I think increasingly, particularly given what we've seen happen in 2016, 2017, you know, we live in an era of fake news. Um, in my own country, in the UK, we had a, a government minister saying people are, have had enough of experts and stuff. So I think open education is plays an important role in how universities position themselves within society and that kind of much broader role they have. So I think just in general, um, higher education needs to be more flexible. And open education isn't the only way it can do that. But it, I think it has some things to say about that, that need for flexibility and how to approach it. So that's my kind of why why we bothered about it. Uh, next, looking at what. Um, so working with uh, Viv Rolf, uh, Owen DeVries and Katie Jordan, particularly Katie Jordan is my uh, ex-PhD student. We we had a conversation, um, uh, admittedly it was in a bar in uh, at the Open Ed conference and Viv had done some work looking at um, the people, the papers that people cite in open education. And she sort of found, and I think it was generally our sense that not, so open education in particularly in North America, has come to mean the OER movement, perhaps MOOCs as well, but less kind of reference back to that early open, open education work. Um, and so what we did was we um, did a search through library databases on some keywords around open education, um, used those, and got, we got the references from all those papers <clears throat> and saw who they had referenced, um, and then put that into a, a a piece of software called Geffrey to create a kind of citation analysis. And what you get is this kind of spreading activation network of different uh, citations and references. Um, I don't know if this would work. Okay, so you can see the kind of citation spreading there. So which ones reference each other begin to grow and spread, kind of like a social media network. Uh, and you find you get these these node papers, node articles that lots of people um, reference. So it's pretty. Uh, I didn't think that would work. That looks good. Yeah. So um, this was. So we went through uh, two or three iterations of this. So taking the papers that those people had cited, and then looking at the ones that they had further cited. And then we went back and said, are there any areas that are missing? Kind of any key references that we wanted to put in, and we added those in as well. And what we ended up with was well, this kind of map here. Um, it's not kind of complete. It's, there's uh, about 172 papers, and obviously there's a lot more than that you could come up with. But they kind of roughly fall into these eight categories. And I think it, it was interesting because our perception that um, open education, distance education, wasn't referenced by a lot of the other groups was borne out really. So you can see distance education down in the bottom right and OER sort of in the middle there. Um, and also there's not an awful lot of overlap between OER and MOOCs. They've begun to kind of form separate communities in a way. Uh, but the thing that sort of binds them together is this idea of open practices, which is perhaps less well defined. So I'm just going to talk about some of those briefly, those areas. I, I, perhaps I don't need to in this audience. 
<clears throat> but anyway, so uh, Open Universities, so I, I'm from the Open University in the UK, so we were founded in 1969, and that model of um, a, a national or at least a large scale university um, offering just distance education, no barriers to entry, uh, part time study, was a model that was copied very successfully kind of around the world. Um, and that's what open education meant for a long time. Uh, and then we have uh, open access publications. And this is quite a robust piece of practice now. So in many countries, we have uh, uh, mandates that says if you publish openly, you have to, uh, if you have public funding, then you need to release your papers under an open access license. And all those kind of those issues around how publishers relate to that, that's kind of fairly robust. Um, OERs, I think, are kind of on a, in a middle ground at some at the moment. They're a bit, so if, if open access publishing is like a, a nice robust city that's kind of been established for a long time in this landscape, then OER is kind of like a, a friendly, bustling town, open educational resources that, that might expand, it might stay the same size. I think it's kind of on the edge of, of the mainstream, as it were, particularly, I think, the open textbook approach in the US. Um, MOOCs, I think, are kind of a bit like the, these ghost cities that tend to get built, where they hope an infrastructure will move in and it will take off, but at the moment, we're kind of not sure at the moment. Um, and open educational practice, I think, is more about finding your own individual path between all these things, kind of finding your own map through that through that landscape. So to think about some of the uh, issues, um, so there was a, a Commonwealth of Learning report out recently, which I'm sure some of you will have read, um, and also some of the research we did in uh, the OER Research Hub. Uh, awareness is still a big issue of OER, so um, we asked people, you know, uh, we asked educators where they go to find their online resources, and it was YouTube, Khan Academy, maybe TED Talks, and that was it. You know, all, all these all these wonderful OER repositories we we have at the bottom just didn't uh, didn't register at all, really. So I think there's kind of just awareness of of OERs as a thing. And the sustainability argument comes up quite a lot, you know. Um, so in the UK, uh, the GISC here funded a lot of OER projects um, earlier on. And when the two-year funding finished and you went back to those projects a bit afterwards, a lot of them had just stopped working. You know, it's the, they only lasted as long as the external funding was there. So I think finding models that, um, that allow sustainability around OER is an issue, although I'll come back to kind of the economics a, a bit later. Uh, reward structures, I think particularly in terms of universities, you know, does, does a university recognize open educational practice if you release OERs? Is it something that's going to get you promotion? Um, is the advice still published? Make sure you publish in the same journals, even if they're closed journals, not open access journals. So until we change the reward structures, that the message people get is that this stuff isn't worth bothering with. Um, and there's also a kind of an element of suspicion, suspicion and discredit around this. So um, particularly a lot, a lot of the commercial publishers saw open access as a, as a challenge to them. So they tried to discredit the quality of it. Uh, and you see this also with open textbook publishers. But also, I think just ourselves as, as practitioners, a lot of educators still worry about things that are free. You know, there's a kind of, if it's free, it can't be good value. But also, I think um, a lot of our identity and self-worth is kind of wrapped up with being an educator, and we're expected to be the expert on a subject. So by using someone else's material, I sort of demonstrate a weakness in that, and, and how will students react to that? Uh, and lastly, I think uh, a, a real big issue is just habit and time. I mean, how many educators do we meet who say, I have loads of spare time? It's, it's not many. So um, anything that's new kind of requires extra time and extra effort. And I think uh, open textbooks are a really good example of this. Um, so even if it saves students money by giving them a free open textbook, for the educator, it's a cost because they have to learn a new textbook, what that textbook covers. And, and often when you're pressured for time, you just fall back on the same slides that you used last year, the same resources you used before. So I think it needs to be an investment in time as well. Uh, and uh, and know-how as well. There is, you know, I think this has got better. I think people know how to share stuff a lot more than they used to. Uh, and slides like slide share and that kind of make that fairly easily. So but there is still some kind of technical barriers. But also I think just know-how about um, Creative Commons license, for instance. You know, like knowledge of, of how to share, how to share effectively, use of social media for sharing those kind of things. So there is a kind of barrier on, on, on how to do this stuff. <clears throat> so uh, just look at the impact now. Um, 
So across those different areas, there's the um, open access citation advantage, which has been found in various studies. So articles that are published under an open access license tend to have more citations and more downloads than those that are behind a proprietary wall. Um, and I think that's particularly true in a, as social media becomes a, a greater part of the dissemination channel. So um, if, if you, there's, there's no point putting a tweet out saying, I've just published a fantastic article. When someone clicks on the link, it says, now pay $30 to access this article. You know, you, you may as well just bury it in your back garden because no one's going to read that. So um, open access kind of allows dissemination through the networks. Um, so I mentioned there was kind of an, an attempt to kind of discredit the idea of open textbooks, particularly in the US. So a lot of the work that people like David Wiley and John Hilton have done is trying to demonstrate that open textbooks are as good, if not better, than uh, the kind of proprietary published textbooks. Um, so th there's a kind of first do no harm principle. And through a number of studies, they've demonstrated that they're either as good, if not better, in terms of student performance, student retention, uh, quality as judged by peers, and those kind of things. So first of all, we move the argument that OER is, is not as good. Um, and often they're kind of finding impacts such as, uh, because particularly in the US, textbooks can be quite expensive. And so a lot of students put off buying a textbook until sort of two or three weeks into the course until they know their academic, the educator is actually going to use it. Because often they'll say, buy this textbook, and then they don't actually use it. Um, so then those students are kind of behind, and, and they've got to catch up. And, and particularly disadvantaged students may not be able to afford the textbook. So whereas with an open textbook, they know that all students have their textbook from day one, and uh, they can teach accordingly. So it kind of can impact upon performance and retention. A kind of not often covered area, I think, is um, OER use by existing students. So some of the research we did at uh, OER Hub found, particularly uh, particularly in the in countries like the UK where the student fees are quite an issue, we found a lot of students were using OER to test out a subject whether before they started studying it, because you don't want to you know, we pay £9,000 a year usually here. You don't want to spend £9,000 studying for one year just before deciding that actually you don't want to do psychology after all you want to do sociology. So a lot of students are trialing subjects, and OER are a really good way to do that because it's, they're usually from universities. They give you a good taste of, of the sort of thing you'd have to get into. Uh, but also we found uh, students who are already in study, uh, formal education, are using OER to, to supplement their studies. They may be studying. Uh, you know, physics at one university, but accessing MIT, Harvard, uh, OER, another, from another university. <coughs> um, it can be used to expand the curriculum. So uh, at Delft University, for instance, they're using, uh, they've accredited some MOOCs from other providers and said to students, you can take these and gain formal credit with us. So it allows you to kind of expand the curriculum you can offer your students. <coughs> And increasingly, I think we see them in course creation. I think this was an area a few years ago people were reluctant to bring in content, but we've all just kind of got used to sharing content more. So whether it's open access publications, uh, use of videos, or uh, open textbooks within courses, I think people are beginning to pull that in and, and use those more often in, in their courses. And we're doing for time, I'll best wrap up. Uh, new institutional models. Um, so I think. We're only beginning to see this little bit, but things like the OER University, which is a kind of cooperative organization between universities, who offer their, their courses uh, freely available on this on the platform, but they can still have their own cohort of studying, and, and that cohort gets the um, the, tu the tuition and the support, the local support. And they're, be they're beginning to offer the first year of study free, so you can do the two courses, business studies and a kind of general studies. You can do it free through the OERU, get formal accreditation, and then you're into the uh, the formal education system then. Um, and I talked about sustainability. I think uh, an area that's of interest is what I call uh, open flip economics. So uh, a Cable Green of uh, Creative Commons says that you know we have lots of money in education. We're just really bad at spending it. And so the model we tend to have is that we um, pay to purchase a copyright good. But what open flip does is kind of switch on its head and say, why don't we pay to produce something, but then it's openly licensed. So uh, they're seeing this with textbooks. Instead of schools and universities purchasing textbooks, we'll pay you to produce, we'll get some writers together, pay you to produce it, but then it's openly licensed and can be freely used. And I think that's a model we might see more of. So you know, li libraries have reasonable budgets, but it all goes to publishers. But instead, you might pay to produce uh, an open textbook. 
but also just a, a OER around particular subjects that we might want to share. Uh, I probably won't go to this, I think my time's up. So uh, Dominic is talking and I are also doing some work uh, for ICD on um, what's called Open Online Flexible and Technology Enhanced uh, Education. So we've kind of broken the education offering down into three main aspects, content, delivery and recognition. And there are two dimensions to that, which are flexibility and uh, openness. And we surveyed uh, a, a number of institutions around the world um, and we kind of we can map them across their different dimensions and how they respond. What you, you see is you get these different patterns that start to emerge. So people are using openness for different things in institutions. So this one, for instance, it's all around flexibility. So openness allows them to be flexible in terms of their offering to students. Um, and we've kind of split up the different approaches to openness there. So, so I think that the key point there is that openness is is not just one thing to institutions. Some are using it for very specific purposes. Some it's kind of core to everything they do, and some it's kind of reaching particular audiences they want to address. Um, I, I think I'll end with this slide here. Yeah. So um, we also surveyed about uh, their use of technology, and just a, a quick point: this is not really about openness, but there's almost a kind of inverse proportion to the amount of headlines a, a technology gets and how much it's actually used. So artificial intelligence is kind of right, is Hard to use for anybody, but has all the kind of big headlines. Whereas the three core things all relate very directly to those three elements of uh, recognition, uh, delivery, and uh, content. Uh, so that's my quick overview of all things open education, and I'll end there. Thank you so much, uh, Martin, for your very inspiring presentation. I noted some uh, reflections and I hope I'll be able to 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 ask some questions in the end uh, so uh, we'll move actually to uh, to my own presentations we are always uh, talking uh, about uh, international experiences and the one I'm presenting here is related to um, uh, my direct uh, experience. Uh, 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 this is um, in in research on ores, it, and uh, um, in particular, actually, Martin um, very uh, correctly separated uh, ores. Uh, from from MOOCs, which is uh, of course correct. Um, in our in the experience, I'm going to 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 introduce you. Uh, we actually uh, worked on MOOC development, considering them as uh, uh, open resources. I will clarify uh, on that in a minute. Uh, the other aspect uh, that. Um, I need to, to clarify at the beginning of this presentation is that uh, the title says uh, impact on learning. Um, I would uh, uh, say that uh, more than uh, learning meant as uh, um, content uh, knowledge acquisition, uh, what we wanted to uh, identify to 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 get uh, was uh, how um, much uh, the students could develop their uh, cross-sectional skills, uh, in particular critical thinking skills. Uh, I'll um, just uh, underline a couple of things regarding critical thinking. Uh, we have been working for uh, um, five years now, I would say, uh, on the development of critical thinking skills in higher education students, especially um, in environments supported uh, uh, by uh, technology. Um, why? Also in Martin's presentation, actually, uh, this uh, topic came out because we, we said that we need to um, make uh, young, younger generations, uh, higher education students in particular, uh, being able to reflect, to be autonomous in their judging, to understand which kind of resources they 
best to uh, to use we are overwhelmed with uh, uh, information being uh, uh, connected all, all the time so we really need to work on development uh, on the development of certain skills like critical thinking in particular and we started studying uh, the definitions uh, regarding critical thinking um, uh, developed uh, through the Delphi report which was a report uh, um, created developed by a group of experts who um, summoned in California in the 90s um, but anyway what do we mean by critical thinking we we uh, we mean that kind of thinking which helps us analyzing, assessing, reconstructing uh, reality. Uh, and we, uh, we, we took as a reference this model related to different skills, critical thinking included, of course, that was our main focus, but also other kind of uh, um, of skills were taken into co consideration in this analysis, in this project, research project we carried out with our students. Collaboration, communication, creativity, and critical thinking, as I said. Uh, the first question we, we started from was to understand if it was possible, if it's possible, uh, to uh, measure critical thinking skills critical thinking skills in higher education students through MOOCs. Uh, uh, why MOOCs? Um, there are different, uh, different uh, reasons. Uh, first of all, you need to know that uh, the students who took part in this research project are education uh, students in, in educational sciences, so education students. Um, MOOCs and the open resources um, are really the issue on which uh, every educator should be uh, ready to, to, to work and with such resources should be uh, ready to work as we, as we said. Uh, and so, in our view, the idea that uh, the students could be involved in developing uh, um, uh, a MOOC uh, um, on a certain specific topic, I will tell you in a minute, could be um, a way to uh, support, increase their critical thinking and, as I said, the four C's skills in general. Uh, reflecting on what they were doing, reflecting on the sources they could use to build these courses, um, addressed to um, other uh, uh, teachers um, dealing with dealing with um, heritage uh, fruition, uh, cultural heritage fruition within um, primary school. Uh, uh, education, uh, teaching and learning. You see here uh, another slide related to the environment, I, I would say uh, the framework where this kind of project uh, took place. This pilot we uh, experienced, we carried out with our students was in fact developed within a European project, the DICE project, which means Digital Innovation in Cultural and Heritage Education in the light of 21st century learning. It is an Erasmus Plus project, uh, six partners participated, different uh, European countries, uh, uh, the UK, the Netherlands, uh, Italy, of course, Belgium. Uh, it's going to hand next February, uh, but the main pillars of this project were uh, development of the 4C skills, um, training of uh, teachers, of primary school teachers, uh, enabling them to uh, use technology um, and integrate uh, cultural heritage fruition in their teaching and learning programs. Uh, so that's why you understand why we tried to um, help students, facilitate students' developing of MOOCs in particular, um, 
using open uh, resources. Uh, why uh, museums and uh, heritage? Um, first of all, um, because uh, in the national, the national um, guidelines in Italy in particular, but also especially at European uh, level, uh, there's a prompt for, from different agencies to support this kind of uh, um, education. Uh, especially uh, with the help of uh, technology uh, and within formal uh, formal frameworks like like primary school teaching uh, and learning. Um, considering that uh, the aims of the project were related to teachers' uh, training, especially in the use of technology in their teaching and learning, uh, in this environment of uh, museum education and primary school teaching and learning, we thought that we could um, reach uh, uh, the different uh, objectives at the same at the same time. Um, their relation, uh, MOOCs and museums, uh, uh, is a fairly uh, recent uh, uh, one. We know about the critics related to, to, to MOOCs, uh, the difficulties especially in considering dropout rates and so on and so forth. Uh, but we've, uh, we have also considered that um, in museum environments, the, um, the idea of promoting uh, the dissemination of their uh, collection contents and the use of technology is getting um, uh, bigger and bigger. Uh, so we thought that that could have been a good way to 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 reach both museum objectives and education objectives. What did the students were asked uh, to do uh, during this uh, um, training? First of all, take part in critical online discussions in groups, uh, working on specific topics related to, of course, uh, museum education in primary school, um, uh, in primary school. Uh, investigate issues, of course, of their interest, guided always uh, by uh, tutors online. Uh, develop and create uh, MOOCs courses uh, in the field of museum education. Uh, um, evaluate uh, the use of such tools and especially evaluate the, uh, the courses that were created by their uh, made uh, uh, by their colleagues during this uh, activity. Uh, to know how to use, uh, of course, a virtual environment, uh, to know how to use collaborative writing tools, because, of course, all these activities were carried out online, and so uh, they had to uh, project and design their courses together, working uh, online and writing uh, together. Uh, they had to become familiar with MOOCs as a concept, and this was not so easy actually, because uh, um, they uh, they referred that from they didn't know about uh, uh, MOOCs and they didn't know what a MOOC was uh, until they had this kind of of training with us. Uh, they could participate also in a, an international contest in the field of museum education and they could know and use the necessary tools to write an article in a foreign language, because English, of course, for them was a, a foreign language in order to participate in this international contest. Which was the hypothesis from which we started our research? We mm, thought that students who use a specific tool to evaluate MOOC quality, because that was the real end of this activity, making them um, work on, on, on the creation of the MOOC first, uh, of course. But then they had to uh, evaluate uh, the course, assess the quality of the course. So self-reflect 
um, on their own work, but also reflect on others' um, work. Uh, and so we thought that uh, uh, carrying out this, this kind of activity, they were able to deepen their understanding of online teaching and learning and acquire sharper critical and analytical approaches. In a minute, I'll show you what we uh, collected from this uh, uh, analysis. Uh, the, the main methodology I want uh, you know go too to deep in in the details of course here, but I can tell you that the main uh, methodology we adopted was peer assessment carried out individually by each student. Mm, through this activity, they had the possibility to gain 1.6 ECTS uh, credits, and the activity lasted um, around 40 hours, and 42 uh, students participated actively and reached the end of, uh, of, um, of the activity of the course. Uh, the model we used uh, and the model we uh, asked them to um, to keep uh, as a reference was uh, a very traditional one. It's uh, the Lectio uh, Magistralis uh, framework. So you see some Latin here, but uh, when you um, get to um, to know which uh, uh, each part, what each part. Uh, describe you recognize uh, actually the structure of uh, uh, traditional and uh, widely used uh, uh, tutorial. Mm, uh, of course, we had the presentation of the subject, introducing the context, the author, the setting of the work they were dealing with, so the topic, I would say. Um, uh, then a discussion of pros and cons between uh, sorry, uh, divisio. So the, the the analysis aimed at understanding the consecutive elements of the text. Uh, a discussion on the pros and cons between students and and the tutor, and then the question. The text following the analysis, the group tutor discussions is subject to a global and critical interpretation. So um, different points, but always keeping um, the, same, the same structure in each group uh, uh, development of the construction uh, of the course. Um, why? Uh, first of all, to have uh, the possibility to compare and to uh, Mm, um, have uh, a, a, a fixed uh, reference for the students that, as I said, were uh, not acquainted at all with all these uh, um, new uh, things they were they were learning uh, during this uh, activity. And then, because this kind of model, this kind of uh, uh, of structure of teaching and learning structure has been has proved to be successful over a long uh, time, and so this means that it can be taken uh, as a, a good uh, reference. The activities, as I said, they had different uh, um, activities to carry out. Um, they had three face-to-face -face meetings. Uh, and then the rest of the activities were all carried out online. Um, why uh, um, these face-to-face -face meetings? We needed to introduce uh, the subject and to be sure that they were actually understanding uh, what uh, their assignments were. Um, they had, uh, the, of course, the first meeting was firstly addressed to that aim, but also, the intermediate face-to-face -face meeting was needed because they uh, they had the possibility to uh, to share to present uh, their their work and what they did so far, and they could interact um, with all the groups uh, together uh, and gain uh, important suggestions, inputs, and so on. And then a final meeting when they could uh, uh, actually assess and evaluate um, each other's work. 
uh, I told you about uh, peer assessment. That was uh, uh, our idea of successful assessment, successful formative assessment. Uh, and uh, uh, the tool we developed to uh, make students reflect and evaluate, assess each other's work was composed of different sessions. Um, it was actually a, a questionnaire, very, very articulated, but a questionnaire, um, focusing on the course, so on what they did with us, and on uh, the MOOC itself. Uh, some results. Uh, as you can see, as regards course content, so the, the content they, they, they developed in each, um, in each program, uh, you can see here, uh, as regards the structure, the completeness, uh, most of the groups uh, uh, gained uh, good, uh, good marks. Something I, maybe I forgot to tell you is that the 42 students who participated in the activity, when they had to, to create the MOOCs, they had to work in, in different small groups made of five, six elements at the most. Mm, as you can see, uh, the, the four and five mark uh, were uh, the most frequent. Um, as regards the MOOC uh, quality, the MOOC they created, and so each, each, uh, each person, each student was evaluating uh, the other's MOOCs. Uh, you see that we, um, we used as criteria um, design and graphic uh, presentation and content co coverage, of course. As I said, the content uh, was uh, uh, always the same. It was related to museum education. So they had to develop MOOCs on museum education for primary school teachers. Then uh, uh, other criteria we asked them to reflect on were related to the skills that those specific MOOCs were intended to uh, support and to develop. Uh, so as you can see, for instance, uh, uh, creativity and uh, collaboration uh, were um, mainly reached by by every uh, group. There are some groups that, of course, had a better impact, some less as regards these two criteria, uh, two indicators. But anyway, um, all of them reached uh, the objectives and developed the objectives. When we go to critical thinking and uh, communication, um, especially as regards critical thinking, uh, being a very complex construct, uh, it was a little bit more difficult. But anyway, uh, we had uh, mm, feedback from that, a good feedback from that. Uh, as regards the general assessment of uh, the MOOC creation, as you can see, all the groups uh, had a, a sufficient score, so a pass score, and some also were uh, over uh, the average. Um, we are carrying out uh, further analysis, especially as regards critical thinking. Uh, using uh, content analysis, which is uh, the most difficult part. Uh, content analysis will be carried out and is actually going um, to be uh, carried out, is, is uh, carried out on uh, every piece of writing uh, that the students produced online while developing uh, these courses. Uh, it is, uh, um, as you might imagine, a difficult issue because we are going to understand in, in this uh, student's uh, production um, different uh, indicators. Uh, they are listed here. I think I'm, uh, I'm running out of time, so I just mentioned the main categories. So justification, relevance, importance, critical evaluation, novelty, new ideas. And here you have uh, the description of each indicator. 
Um, and according to uh, uh, this uh, model of content analysis, we are um, we would like to get uh, more information regarding what they did and the development each student had on uh, critical thinking issues. This is the model we are going to, to use, we are using actually, uh, to measure this kind of uh, um, indicators. There's also uh, the formula. We are, of course, uh, um, working as different uh, in, in a group uh, of researchers and each researcher is actually evaluating this kind of students production so uh, taking into consideration this this formula uh, we are um, very visionary and we are trying also to work on a possible um, uh, automatic uh, revision of this kind of production uh, according to, to this criteria. It's something which is very difficult to reach, but we are actually uh, trying. Uh, getting to the conclusion, we thought that this kind of work, of structure we built, um, could have been innovative. Uh, it was in line, of course, with the aims of the the, the European pro project where this activity is set. Um, there's uh, this idea of connection between MOOCs or uh, in, in, in general, in a wider sense, uh, and cultural heritage, which is a very, um, how can I say, uh, sensitive uh, issue. In, in Italy, especially, because we need to develop uh, um, uh, and to support uh, educational attention to cultural heritage issues, uh, because that is our uh, um, one of the main resources of, of the country. So that's why we, we need to support that as, as a country, but of course, uh, um, this idea of spreading culture is essential uh, in the time we are living to develop certain skills and to be able uh, to uh, to be uh, free citizens. I think. So uh, I think I got to 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 the end of my presentations. The others in the group, uh, uh, there are also other researchers who participated, as you might imagine, because the, the work was a lot. Uh, the other participants in the group are here: um, Francesco Agrusti and Maria Rosaria Re, uh, who are members of the group. So I thank you so much, and again, we, I hope you will have some questions in the end to also to understand better uh, what I told you about. Um, now I think that it's time to uh, give the floor to Cinzia. So let me see, here it is. Cinzia, um, uh, she is uh, the head. Uh, of uh, um, the OER Lab, Smart Learning Institute in Beijing Normal uh, University. Uh, thank you, Cynthia, for being with us, of course. Uh, and she will tell us about the current state of, advan of advancement of OER in China and Zlibno. Thank you, Cynthia, and please, the word to you. Can you hear me? Thank you. Hello. Hi. Thank you very okay. much. And now, okay. Now. Thank you. Uh, hello, everyone. Thanks for your interest in my presentation. And I come from the Open Educational Resources Lab, a smart learning institute at Beijing Normal University. Also, today, um, I'm honored to share the current state of uh, advancement of OER in China, and uh, I'll show you what our lab have done in the past two years for OER. 
Uh, this is the model that we uh, developed to assess the development level of OER in a country, uh, which will be published in a Springer book soon. And the current state, the current development of OER in China will be also presented by discussing each factor included in this model. Um, let's first we look at the infrastructure, which will be presented from the perspectives of both technology and the repository. And as for the technology, and we can see that the internet access in China is higher than the uh, global average, and uh, um, the computer student ratio in China is a little it, it's a little bit lower than the global uh, average. In the repository. Um, Actually, you know, uh, the infrastructure is established and maintained uh, in in China. Uh, you know, uh, mainly by government, university, or companies. These are some good example repositories in China. Uh, for example, the National Educational Resources Public Service Platform, established by Ministry of, of Education of China, and the normal e uh, National E-Learning Resource Center built by the Open University of China, and 101 Education PPT uh, built by NetDragon Company. You know, the policy is a very important factor for the development of OER. And the policy uh, can be made by both government and the institution in China. From the government level, different government departments are responsible for making different policies about OER. For example, the Ministry of Education is responsible for developing specific educational policies and the plans for production and the use of OER. And the Ministry of Science and Technology draws up science and technology policies that promote the use of OER, um, you know, support some the um, uh, support some you know basic technology uh, establishment in China. And the Ministry of Finance creates uh, funding policies to pr uh, provide OER grants and so on. These are some very important policies made by China, uh, Chinese government. And you can see that the first policy of OER um, is proposed in the year of 2000, which is even earlier than uh, when the concept of OER is firstly proposed by UNESCO in the year of 2000, 2002. Um, we compiled the main contents of these important policies made by Chinese government in recent years um, with the main ideas proposed by UNESCO in Paris OER Declaration in 2016. And we found that eight of the, of the ten aspects are consistent between UNESCO and China, except, except that the open licensing are rarely mentioned in Chinese, in Chinese policy. And these are some very important policies pr produced by uh, institutions of China. You know, uh, open license is also a very important factor to assess the development of OER. And uh, there are three types of open license in China. The first one is educational resources reset in public domain. They are unprotected by copyright law, but the permit for using and reusing freely. The second type is the resources openly licensed, such as those under CC. And the last type refers to the resources authorized by government for public um, freely use. CC China was established in uh, the very uh, very early time, actually. Um, however, not many Chinese people would like to use CC. And the mainstream educational platforms still adopted the copyright law of China. As for the resources in China, we have different formats of OER, such as uh, the audio, video, cosware, and we can search the resources by different ways, like by subject, educational levels, topics, uh, institution, and even by assessment. And the resources, um, the open 
Open resources in China covers different educational level like K-12, higher education, vocational education, and informal education. And you can see the amount of resources in China are very huge. And you can see um, only in Baidu platform, you can find over 150 million documents online. As for the curriculum and the pedagogy, uh, in classroom, we use the flipped classroom, micro classes, and blended learning to teach with OER. And we also have MOOCs and some other OER tools, uh, like 101 uh, Education PPT, to support self-learning out of um, classroom. Um, the outcomes of OER in China refers to uh, different levels. From the school level, um, the OER can help reduce costs, uh, develop network between educators and expertise. And from the level of classroom, the OER can um, can be you know, helpful for increasing the variety of classroom activities and also can assist the teachers in providing useful learning tasks. And from the educator level, um, the OER can help the school community and increase increase educational quality. And from the student's perspective, OER is helpful uh, for them to increase uh, availability on free to access resources for learning and also can support independent and informal learning at home. The stakeholders in China include the policymakers, um, university and the school leaders, educators, teachers, librarians, researchers, learners, and the parents. This, uh, you can see that these stakeholders are also the users of OER. They are very inclusive. All the factors we discussed uh, um, above included in the model will contribute to the development of OER in China and the family together contribute to promoting and achieving SDG4. We also have some challenges for the development of OER in China. For example, uh, we still need to promote the public awareness. Uh, we need to uh, further develop um, make the development of open learning systems in China. And we also uh, need to you know, explore more ways to get find to, uh, some funding to support OER development. Uh, we also need some empirical studies uh, to get the evidence about the outcomes of OER. And we also need to um, increase the teacher trainings to have to use OER in their teaching. Okay, so uh, just, uh, um, you know, as w what we mentioned about the current development of OER in China, and let's look at what we have done for OER in the past two years. This is a brief introduction of uh, our institute. The Smart Learning Institute of Beijing Normal University serves as an experimental platform comparison scientific research technology technology development and education. And our institute is jointly established by Beijing Normal University and uh, uh, the Alernity Company. So we refer to different areas of research. Our, our OER lab is to study on the solution of OER. Um, Andrew is impacted to the developing countries, constructed the OER community for the Belt and the Road countries, and also published some reports on the trends of ICT in education. These are uh, some main research areas of our lab, uh, and including ICT in education research, OER research, OER platform, educational research database, and all of these research interests are carried out based on the OER international community. These are some outcomes that we have in the past two years. Uh, we have published one book and three uh, national reports. We also have a database and a platform which are on the construction and will be open to the public soon. 
This is our uh, OER international community. So far, we have established a strong partnership with uh, some institutions and experts from all, uh, over 30 countries, such as Malaysia, Singapore, uh, some Central and Eastern European countries, like Serbia, and uh, <clears throat> some Arab countries. We are still, you know, always calling for partners from more countries uh, for our OER community. And you are very welcome to join us if you are interested uh, using OER to achieve SDG4, uh, promoting global co uh, collaboration, and sharing network resources and knowledge. Okay, this is what uh, this is what I want to share today, and thank you for your listening. Thank you so much, Cynthia, for your uh, report on, on the Chinese uh, uh, situation regarding ours. It's a very interesting landscape, uh, of course. Uh, and I'll, uh, I have one question for you, but we'll leave it to the end. Uh, and so now let's introduce Dominic, Dominic Hoare. Um, let me share your 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 presentation. Here it is. Uh, Dominic uh, is a, a, actually a British national, but has a doctorate in comparative education from the Technical University of Dresden. For over a decade, he worked for the German Center for Higher Education and Science as senior researcher and international project leader on higher education governance and conditions of student life. He was the lead author of the OECD Synopsis Report on OER Developments uh, Across the World, uh, published in 2015, and other um, uh, important publications. Currently, he is senior researcher at FIBS Research Institute for the Economics and Education of the Economics of Education, sorry, and Social Affairs in Berlin, where he is evaluating the feasibility of the UNESCO or Global Monitoring Initiative and leading a project with the International Council on Open and Distance Education on digital adoption of higher education provisions and the OFAT. Uh, model. So uh, thank you so much for being with us and please the floor to you for your uh, report on the German experience. Thank you okay, so much. Thank you very much Dominic. Antonella. Can, uh, can you hear me okay? Is the sounds all right? Good. Okay perfect. Yeah I can all hear right. you. So um, yes yeah. thank you very much for this opportunity to talk a little bit about Germany but also we are in the context of what's happening in Germany and what's happening in the world. Um, it was really nice now to hear the previous presentations. So Martin started out by saying, okay, we're maybe as we are, we're in a bustling town and we have to try and get into the big town and establish ourselves. Um, one of those ways, I think, is pretty much what Antonella was uh, describing, which are these kind of new demands which are coming into the education uh, sector. And one of those is trying to think of ways we can um, give people new skills, new, new learning skills um, on the one side for, uh, through digitalization, on the other hand through the uh, increasing diversity in our education systems. And um, the thing uh, that uh, Cynthia presented, which was really nice, is just to show also how OER fits into their whole strategy of um, ICT in education and how it's kind of seems to have developed quite a bit out of that. These are things that are very relevant for the German case because um, really uh, we can be called in Germany uh, late starters, so late comers to the OER area. It's not exactly true, and I'll come back to this in a minute, but essentially if you look at you know, our international presence, it's been quite low until uh, recently, um, but there's a lot being has been happening kind of in the background and a lot of that is now coming to the foreground and coming together in a nice interesting way which is what I would like to talk about. Um, just to tell you though that uh, uh, together with my colleagues Jan Neumann and uh, Jürgen Musmerholz we also did a, uh, a publication on this um, where the developments are explained a bit more in detail. 
just to this background point firstly of what are the big kind of trends going through uh, policy debates and those that are particularly relevant for uh, education. And I thought since we are already in uh, the e-learning week, maybe just to track um, in the German area, what about Google Trends looking at one or two of the key terms um, that we're, we're used to in the German area. Uh, one of those is e-learning. Um, other ones are, you can see there, uh, automization, uh, the MOOCs, of course, Industry 4.0, and digitalization. What I want to emphasize, actually, is um, you can see if we were in 2014, e-learning was still a really, really quite a big topic in terms of at least search, search terms that the people, people are putting into Google. Whereas now you see in Germany, the big topic going well above everything else is digitalization. And this is relevant because at the moment, um, Practically all of the German states are developing digitalization strategies, which are very comprehensive strategies. Some of the early starter states focus on particular areas, for example, as I mentioned already, in Industry 4.0. But what we're seeing at the moment is these very comprehensive strategies about how one of the how a German state would like to meet the challenges coming through digitalization. And within that, we've got the question of education and training. And we need, within that, most of those strategies are now mentioning OER. So that's really um, a lot to do with the, the landscape that we have in Germany. So if we're looking at this landscape, or here I've called it the playing field, um, just to go back a stage first, we have had a very strong and we have a very strong grassroots movement in Germany. Um, and this has been, become less, this is less present because in a way on the policy level, we've been a bit slow going and, and we've been latecomers. So we have many, cha many champions of OER. And the interesting thing is over the years now, they developed uh, a very strong community of practice for change. Um, Many, many, through many, many bar camps, particularly, so on conferences, um, there have been chances for people to come together for, from the community and talk about what they're doing and what challenges they have of trying to get their grassroots uh, development uh, more established. Now what we have is coming, on the one hand, really through this digitalization in education, we have kind of the bigger debate coming through, which is, OK, education now has to change because of the challenges through digitalization. And OER is being put into this kind of mainstream um, agenda. At the moment, however, if you actually look at what's written, um, OER is mentioned in a very limited way, mentioned mostly in terms of just providing more materials uh, which are more um, up to date. This doesn't very much, very well reflect what's actually happening in the grassroots uh, initiatives, where there, there's been much more of a focus on what can we do that's cool, what can we do that's innovative through using OER. The, and, and here you can see on the uh, right-hand side of the slide, just as a, as a picture, which, is, which comes from the uh, OER world map, um, there's a special page now where you can see developments in Germany. Uh, you can see that right across Germany, we've, we've got these OER active people or OER developments. Now, the interesting thing that's happened over the uh, very recent, uh, really past two years, has been a coming together of what I was mentioning now, the educational agenda. Martin talked a lot about it uh, in his presentation. Diversity of the pupil body, diversity of the student body, and the fact that if you have diversity in Learners, you need diverse paths, you need diverse ways to support students. So this is seen as a big agenda uh, in Germany at the moment. Uh, then we have, um, basically, we need new content because of the digital, digital agenda, but we also need new learning opportunities. So these things are coming together. Um, and kind of from bottom up, then, this OER community. Now, uh, two years ago, a very interesting uh, initiative was launched, which is uh, funding from the German government, from the federal government. It's a program of uh, 6.6 million uh, euros, 
running for uh, two years. Um, and essentially what it does, and this is really quite interesting, is it picks up on the idea that we do have a strong community. So within this, uh, this OER program uh, to support OER, most of the projects which have been supported about, about things like training the trainer, so capacity building, um, helping people understand how they can be using uh, OER, um, and also kind of network activities, which is bringing people together. Um, so this coming together has really been uh, quite, quite interesting and quite specific, I think, to the German uh, situation. If we look at, um, no, let me just go back to one thing before I come to, because I've got a bit more time than I thought I would have. Normally, as the last person, you've got much less time. Um, so let me just <laughs> mention uh, two things, really. So at the moment in Germany, it's been the case that a lot of the initiatives have been in the school area. Um, they've been very much supported through higher edu people in higher education, but it's been things like um, thinking of new ways of uh, teacher training, but also thinking of new ways of providing you know, a more activated, authentic type of learning uh, within, uh, within the school setting. And um, one very interesting thing on the top-down level is uh, almost all of the German states have what they call a, uh, uh, an educational media platform um, where they collect uh, materials which um, teachers within their state, generally speaking, can be using to enrich their learning, uh, their, their teaching and learning. Um, these uh, so-called Bildungsserver, these educational platforms, they got together um, about a year and a half ago and decided that, uh, if possible, um, they would. So they set a principle that the principle is uh, OER first for all these materials. So as as much as possible, they will be developing these materials as OER. And there are also, there's a certain construction within Germany which enables also these platforms to exchange some materials between each other. So this is very interesting to see there that uh, these, these servers are working together. Um, and um, another thing I wanted to mention, because that's almost the next part in the pipeline, is, okay, so now you've got these materials. Now you have to use these materials, or you would like to use these materials within your classroom setting. Um, we know through various research, and Martin already mentioned it, that uh, one of the problems with OER is how to actually use it in a sensible way, how to use it in a, in a simple way, also for people who want to just have something simple that they can almost plug and play and then use in their classrooms. And so we've had one, um, just, to, just to mention one example, we've had one very interesting development, which is uh, an OER editor which is uh, being provided by uh, an organization called Tutori. Tutori was set up um, as, a, uh, as a project, um, but it's uh, turned now into a startup. And um, at the moment, it's, it's um, just making the tra transition between this kind of uh, uh, donation or grants-based funding to um, a funding base which is based on subscriptions. Um, and uh, it's really being used quite a lot because it's tried to get to exactly this point of how can we make it easier for teachers to use uh, OER. So I think this is a very interesting initiative. Another one which might surprise you as well because uh, in the OER space we're very used to um, talking about the publishers as the baddies um, and also as, as people who, as organizations which find it hard to innovate. Um, Certainly, we can see that one or two of the publishers are actually at least testing or experimenting with the idea of OER for some of their products. So uh, one of those publishers called Nielsen um, has now brought out uh, two books uh, using a Creative Commons uh, uh, BYSA uh, license, which I think is very interesting. Um, so it is true, however, um, I think as Martin mentioned, that uh, uh, at the moment we don't really have any complete courses being offered in Germany as OER. Um, but you can see that in a way, and that's why I chose the title of my presentation, there's been much more of a focus on trying to get things 
easily into classroom settings or educational settings, and then to try and use that to uh, to promote innovation. And I think in that context, this idea of saying, okay, a lot of the government support is there to actually help and support this and activate this kind of uh, innovation is interesting. Of course, uh, despite that, you still need to change some of the policy framework conditions and you need to think about funding. So with that, let me just come to the four lessons we drew uh, through, uh, through looking at the case in Germany and to see, okay, what things do we think one could maybe apply to other countries as well. Um, so the first one I've mentioned quite a lot. Um, there, we see that there's a potential uh, for OER to support um, emerging educational debates, and we really see that this is happening. So this is really the chance now for OER to really get into the mainstream, uh, where it really becomes interesting, because then its full potential can actually be uh, developed in uh, inside of the established system. Um, also, uh, through the German case, we can say, well, you know, there really are, and I think we find this in many countries, a significant number of OER practitioners, and we have to think of ways to support those. And one of those ways is that governments bec can become more active in that. Um, you know, we're in Germany, so we love laws. Um, so, of course, copyright is a major issue for us. And it's been interesting because there's uh, one um, one established story here in Germany that uh, the OER was really pushed um, when the publishers actually started to say uh, in 2011, we're going to check now how much copyright is actually being misused within the school uh, school setting, and we want to actually start um, charging those schools for um, for all of that misuse. And uh, one of the arguments is, well, okay, well, since that happened. A lot of people looked for a new way, way around or a new solution to that, and that's where we came to OER. I think that's true, and I think that it definitely explains a lot of the uh, OER initiatives from those people who are very active in the area. Um, but I think also when we discuss this situation of what, how is copyright organized and what, situ what uh, significance does it have for teachers and for tutors, um, the German copyright situation is quite tricky. And we actually think perhaps also because it's quite tricky, it also uh, makes people very much more unsure. So uh, in the actual report, we call for two things, which is uh, really a simplification of the, the copyright law, but also, of course, um, making more use of things outside of um, this copyright in terms of uh, Creative Commons or the kind of copy left idea. The, uh, the last thing I'd like to mention, uh, because this is very important to us, uh, the authors of the report, um, and I think it was great that Cynthia particularly mentioned it, um, and of course Martin uh, with his work in uh, the OER uh, or, or the, the Open Education Research Hub is pushing this as well. We do need more research, um, but we, of course, we need more research that goes beyond just looking at textbooks. Um, we need research which is capturing as many of these rich stories we can find of all the initiatives around the world. Um, but we also need to try and look at ways of, um, of uh, representing the impact that OER can have. Um, we used as a baseline um, the entries within the OER world map because we found that very helpful. Um, that enabled us for Germany to provide some really nice statistics on what's happening in Germany. Um, so we really think the OER world map can be further developed in this way. Um, but one thing we actually criticize um, in the program I've just mentioned in Germany, where I said it's a great program because it's supporting um, capacity building, this program supported by the government um, doesn't foresee at all a, um, a, an accompanying monitoring of what's happening. And this is really vital. It's vital for us in the in the community, in the space, who want to um, support OER. But it's also vital for policymakers because they have to be able to see what impact um, various initiatives are having. So on that last point, I will uh, leave you and perhaps we can go to some of the questions. Thank you very much.
Thank you so much, Dominic. Uh, yeah, in fact, you're, you're, you're right. Uh, I always think that, uh, uh, you know, we, we don't focus enough on evaluation and assessment or monitoring, and that's instead uh, an important part of, of what we do, because we need to understand if we actually reach our objectives or, or not. So thank you so much. Uh, I hope we can get some questions from participants. Uh, anyway, have some, so we have uh, uh, a way to uh, let me get this one so that we can we can have again your names um, in the front. So I can see questions, but maybe we can warm up with uh, one of mine, uh, which I, is actually addressed to all of you. I mean, Dominic, Martin, Cinzia, all of you. Uh, because um, actually we have learned from, from, from your presentations that there's uh, um, a considerable uh, attention uh, to uh, all ERs and, uh, you know, resources to be used in educational settings. Uh, there are also different policies, I see, uh, to support the use of such, uh, of such resources. Um, in Italy, we don't have a great support in that sense anyway. Uh, but from what you, you told us, there's, there's a considerable support. Um, my question is actually related to practice. Do you think, do you know about your colleagues? I mean, the neighbor uh, door colleague. Uh, do they actually uh, use um, open resources. Um, I mean, we we said that you know how they should be used, how they you know you you also showed numbers in that sense. But according to your personal perception, what happens you know in our universities, in our uh, educational institutions? Dominic, I see you are, you wanted to <laughs> to give a feedback. I can't hear you. Mm -hmm. Oh, okay. Right, okay. I think. Uh, yeah, yeah, yeah now. Turn it on. Um, yeah, so I would argue probably similarly to Martin, but I'm sure you can uh, add to it if you want. I mean, I, I, mean, I do think this general argument, uh, which was particularly, um, it was particularly published, uh, was looking at the OER program in the UK. Um, was that essentially we're looking at an iceberg. So whenever we actually ask, are people using OER? Um, in fact, one of the major problems we have is what is, what do people understand as an OER? So people are using um, educational resources in the kind of way we would like them to use. Um, so in terms of, you know, de facto, are mm -hmm. they using something similar to OER in a way that we would expect? Um, I think you would find a lot of people, a lot of instructors, a lot of teachers are. Um, but generally speaking, this is um, more to do with them ignoring the copyright issue. And um, so my one of my major arguments for OER is, in fact, um, OER clarifies exactly this copyright issue. You, can, you, you really can get around it. Um, but um, it's it's difficult. That's why I really appreciate also the the work of Tutori, who are trying to make this very simple, very, making it very simple for you to actually attach a license to to anything you produce. So uh, yes, I think people are. But I mean, I can mm. tell you certainly from um, the people I the the kind of normal people I know around here, um, it's very hard to talk to anyone about OER because they don't actually know what. I see, I see. Uh, yeah, there, there's this. In fact, and this relates, I think, to the question Sandra is, uh, is uh, making. Uh, again, to all of you, 
uh, she's asking, what do you think are the obstacles to have OERs as a mainstream? Maybe, Cynthia, do, do you want to answer? Martin? I don't know if Martin is there. Uh, um, in my view, if I can give a feedback uh, um, to this question, in, in my view, actually, uh, in my experience, in my environment uh, in Italy, there's, um, there's a cultural obstacle, I think. Uh, as I said, we we don't have so much support from from the government. Uh, they started a program, uh, especially for for schools, uh, where they 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 tried to to support uh, uh, the use of technology. So in it's a, it's a wide uh, uh, program, uh, not so much. Specifically, specifically focused on OERs, OERs or MOOCs. Um, so, you know, it can be distracting again. Uh, we have huge problems uh, still with, uh, with uh, the, 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 the basic, uh, you know, um, network facilities. So we are we have schools and universities with difficulties in connection. So uh, these are big big problems. And there's not a a, a, a structure, that, a, an institutional uh, support. So as also Martin was was mentioning uh, before. Uh, there are huge costs uh, on, you know, individuals, on individual teachers, or or when you know it's possible on on individual departments or schools, which have to invest in terms of, co of course, of uh, finances, but also of time, as as Martin uh, and you yourself were were mentioning. It's not a, a, an easy situation. Another thing we should do um, is a, a sort of uh, training for 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 teachers and lecturers also at university level because not so many teachers are acquainted with what OERs are and how they can they can use it. Um, you know, uh, students as I. We, we, we told you about students in our uh, department who were not acquainted at all on what was a MOOC or, or an OER. Uh, but uh, it's even worse with some teachers and lecturers. So I think that, that obstacles are also related about knowledge, about uh, communication on this kind of opportunities, which I think are very important opportunities. I don't know if you, Martin or Cintia or Dominic, you want to add something on. on yeah. Can you hear me okay? Dominic, please. I think I covered. And then Martin, okay. Um, yeah, I think I covered a few of my presentation. I think the, the other thing I guess is it's not clear what the problem is that they're solving for a lot of academics. I think that's why in the US, the kind of open textbook approach has got some traction because it's a very simple problem, which is solving student costs around textbook. And it's not a very interesting problem, that's the only thing. It's kind of once you've solved it, where do you go from there? So people now begin to talk about open pedagogy. But I think often for educators, it's like, you know, what is it I'm going to be able to do better? I think we, uh, so I think in the OER community, we can work much better on that kind of pitch. Because often it's, it's fairly vague, you know, it's, it's an altruistic thing or. It, it will help you with open pedagogy, or but I think it's often it's a bit of a, a delayed benefit. I think it's a, when there's a very specific benefit that we can give to people for using them, that, that kind of helps. Yeah, I'm sure. I'm sure. Dominic, you want to add something? I totally agree with that, and I actually think that uh, in a way this question, what is the obstacle to OER getting into the mainstream, is the wrong way around. 
Um, it's actually more about what can OER do within the mainstream. And I think this is a bit of, the, exactly as Martin said, this is a bit of the point. That's why I was saying for Germany, it's, it's going to be within the digital agenda. I think that OER is really going to come, going to get its full potential because otherwise the digital agenda just means um, getting a whole load of computers into classrooms, which is, uh, which is a very, very um, poor, poor way of uh, developing for the future. So you need to think about new ways of teaching and learning. And then through that, you have to, um, you can use OER to uh, develop this potential. So I think it's more about, it's not a it's not an obstacle to getting into the mainstream, it's more what does the mainstream want from OER? Yeah. Huh. Uh, I, I have uh, one question myself for Cynthia. Uh, um, I know we don't have so much time, but this last question for, for Cynthia. Uh, I was wondering when you were telling us about the Chinese uh, perspective and situation, um, if you have um, a knowledge of which kind of uh, uh, sources uh, do teachers preferably use? Do you use uh, international uh, OERs or uh, you focus mainly on uh, own production? Um, on, I on think Chinese actually uh, the, the, the OER users in China uh, prefer to use the resources uh, in Chinese because, you know, language and the culture is um, are very, uh, you know, mm. um, it's very difficult very difficult for some normal teachers and uh, and actually at the present our institute is working on uh, finding some ways to solve such a problems about language uh, for example you know we connected with the foreign language association in China and uh, they uh, they are uh, established by different foreign language universities in China and they would like to uh, give us some support to solve the problems of language uh, you know we are working on establishing some uh, platform of OER for uh, the Belt and the Road countries. And uh, the Belt and Road countries included many countries with different languages, and especially uh, for some small languages like uh, uh, Serbian, something like that. So we need some uh, foreign language experts to give us support to uh, make some uh, at least uh, we made some uh, brief instruction for some resources uh, in different languages and uh, so that the users can uh, search them and uh, uh, using some local engine. Yeah. And uh, I also want to, uh, you know, talk um, about something related to uh, Sandra's question. You know, um, yeah, you know, I, I just talk about in my uh, presentation mm -hmm. that we have many uh, challenges when we try to developing uh, the OER in China. But I think the most important one is um, about the uh, awareness. You know, in China, actually the teachers, they would like to use um, educational resources in their teaching. Actually, they, they already use them every day because many of the uh, resources are made by um, you know, by some uh, under some fundings of government, and uh, uh, we have some repositories of OER established by government and permit using for free. So actually, the teachers use them every day, but they didn't realize that they are using OER because they they don't know what is OER. You know, so they also like have some awareness of open license. <laughs> They don't know how to uh, correctly use the open license to 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 knock the, the resources they provided. So um, uh, this is what I, I want to say. I think the uh, increase the value of OER is very important in China, and uh, it's uh, one of the difficulties to to make the OER um, as a mainstream. But it's the same thing in Italy too. So you know, it's it's really what I think is uh, uh, it's the main issue to uh, uh, disseminate uh, and to let you know everyone. Or, of course, 
and most of all those working within the educational uh, um, environment, uh, uh, the culture of OERs. Uh, as I told you, our idea to train our students who will be educators in, in some time in this kind of field was a, a main objective. Now they know about it, they know what OERs and what MOOCs are, and they they will use it in their teaching, in their future teaching and learning. So you you need to start bottom up, in my view. What is uh, Dominic? You want to add I, something? I agree with you. Um, I mean, I think I think we all agree then that this thing of bringing top uh, top down and bottom up together is really really important. Yeah. Yeah. It's important, absolutely. So I think I w we ran out of time. Uh, we can, you know, end here our webinar. First of all, I would like to thank you all, Cynthia, Martin, uh, and Dominic, for participating and giving us this different uh, uh, views in different international views on on the subject we all are interested in. Uh, I thank you so much. I forgot to tell you that uh, uh, besides uh, uh, teaching at Roma Tre University in Italy, I also chair the NAP, the Network of Academics and Professionals within the Eden. Um, so I would like you to 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 have a look uh, at our. Uh, events and possibilities and to take part in our network as we did today Thank which you very is very, very important. Thank you all for Hi. participating. Bye-bye.